All right, listen up, Spuds. This is Zap Brannigan, eh? master of time, space, and everything else in between. And, uh, oh, yeah, winner of this year's Modesty Award. Yeah. You're listening to You Suck. What's the difference with Al and Tom? You're one stop for this sort of thing. Yeah. You know, I watch that video every single week. And when I watch it, I'm like, wow, well, like what a wide arrangement of people have come on the show. It's it's not just like, you know, actor, producers, you know, uh, filmographer, whatever it might be, like anything that normally I'd want to speak to. It's it's like Adam Brunel, you know, the Shropshire lad, Cook. Um, there is, you know, of course, Billy West, voice actor. There's um, uh, whole, like Ed Curry, uh, pepper expert. Like what a weird sort of uh, eclectic group of people we've managed to get on the show. It's, it's insane to me. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to What's the Difference podcast. I'm Tom Bruno. I'm David Raby. Very good. Um, as you can see, Alex is not here. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that. We'll start off with Wednesday was pod aid. Um, if anyone did not get to watch the live 24 hour podcast challenge, we did. We met our goal of, uh, I think it was up to like 1100 pounds near the end, oh, which is like nice. 13, 1400 dollars American for those that aren't into the conversion. Um, we did really well. First time charity event, not bad. We we raised a lot of money for uh, Lingen Davis, which is a, an amazing charity um, foundation out in Shropshire. So good on us, right? Like let's pat ourselves in the back. I'm very, I'm very proud of us. Yeah, I know. Right? So am I. Like a couple of guys from the middle of nowhere. We're just like, well, you're. I'm in the middle of nowhere. You're from a real place, and so is our <laughs> guest, actually. Um, so, guys, this week um, is an amazing guest. I re- I re- reached out in like August uh, to this gentleman, and I was just going through my MDB, and I was like, whoa, he did this. And he did this and he did this. And it all started because um, a movie is in pre-production right now, which started this whole thing, which is um, Hocus Pocus 2 is in pre-production. At least IMDb says it is. Um, and everybody's oh, getting all, true. Yeah. Well, dude, they also <laughs> had like this hiring thing that my wife tried getting on. She wanted to be an extra for the movie. Um, oh, nice. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, I was like, cool. If that's what you want to do. That's why I'm me. But then it was like, you know, Hey, now you pay money. I'm like, uh, I don't think a talent agency does that. So <laughs> don't, don't give them money. We don't have any, um, <laughs> regardless. Um, so today's his guest is uh producer writer, David Kirshner. Hello, sir. Hi, how are you guys? Nice to see you, Tom and David. <laughs> it's good seeing you. <laughs> um, so David, right off the bat, man, like your film career is just long as the day, as the year, as the as the infinite. It's it's huge. It's gigantic. If I was to print it out, I would have to kill like thirty trees for it. Huh. <laughs> it's it's God, very when impressive. You, when you say that, it it startles me. It's so weird because no matter how much you do or what you do, like I look around my office right now and I see all this stuff, but it's just like. I'll never do this again. That's it. And I do that every single time. I'm positive that there will never be another one. But I'm always amazed when someone says something as kind as what you just said. But it 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 does shock me. I I it's a it's a weird feeling. I'm not sure what it means psychologically, but it it's yeah, I just I think it's the artist. Um I, I'm someone that draws literally, I I draw. And mm-hmm. uh, and maybe just the artist's insecurity of just never thinking you will be you will ever be able to do something as good as what you did before, which right. is so funny, and that really speaks to like how true of a person you really are. Because people can get full of themselves, right? Like you can make a hit and then be like, "I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread." Look at me! But <laughs> you have pumped out hit after hit after hit after hit. Your record is very very good. I was looking over everything. I was like, "I love that. I love that." And you still think that, you know, that you're not so sure that you're not you're not going to be able to do it again, which is crazy to me because, like, I, I got to go over some of this. And it's it's just so funny how wide it is um, <laughs> for writing credits alone. Like, actually, this is filmography. Um, we, we have amazing things like Five Will Goes West, American Tale. We have the regular American Tale, Pirates of the Dark Water, which, by the way, I watched that as a kid. Like I, yeah, I, I watched the shit out of Pirates of the Dark Water, which I haven't thought about in years until I saw it. I was like, <laughs> oh my god, I saw that. Yeah. Um, Remember having Hocus some book. of the action figures? I had uh, the action yeah. figures. Oh, yeah. I we got, did. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love having them. You have those? Oh my god! Oh, I do. That's... I have the ship. I have. 
I'm crazy with that stuff. I'm just a major toy person. So you are. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Toys oh, yeah. are the best, right? Toys. There's yes. just something about them. Um, we had Rob Bruce on uh toy expert, not till I think right around Christmas. And I, I had him rate like the, uh, the highest ranked toys throughout the last like 10 decades or whatever. And it was, it was pretty funny because he's very knowledgeable and he's like, I don't know who wrote that, but they're wrong. And he's like, this is what it is. And this is what it is. And he's, he's very, very smart. Um, even so much to the point where um, my mom had this toy and it, it basically made your own monsters with like a little heater. What you do is you take like these uh, little hard plastic blocks and you put in this little heater. The, hot, the air would like make it, it creepy crawlers. Kind of creepy crawler esque. It's like um, it's like a something strange change machine. If I'm not mistaken, it's from the 60s. And like I, I just oh, okay. it was called a thing maker. And, yes. Yes. Uh, and you pour goop in it. And into the well, these were metal molds, and Mattel, I mm. believe, made it. And you would you could create monsters and uh, even Batman stuff that yes. Mattel licensed. Yeah, I oh, love what? that. Yeah, yeah that was uh, burned on that, by the way. Oh, absolutely. There, there was so many accidental fires, and I'm <laughs> sure like people. The, <laughs> I'm sure the mafia was just like they just ball out the stock with it, they just start putting in buildings. They're like, there you go, just leave it alone. It'll take care of it yourself. Uh, electrical fire, you see. Um, it's it's amazing how much they didn't care about kids back in the day. They're just no, like sure. I, I mean, those chemistry sets. I mean, uh, th th that's probably a junior starter kit for a terrorist. I mean. The stuff that could go <laughs> in there, well, I mean, it was it was toxic. It was terrible. That's so much fun. <laughs> They're like, here, kid, here's a vial of asbestos. Yeah, have a I great remember it was time. like a there was a commercial I saw. It was a, like a old, you know, on YouTube, the like fifties commercial of like a little detective set you can get your kid, and like the guns look like real fucking like guns God, and shit, right. and they like, oh, dude. Yeah, prior, I'm like um... the, the orange plug that they put in to let everyone know that you're not going to shoot them. They're like, kill them. You know, yeah. it's it's crazy. Um, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I think what I love about toys is it brings you back to a certain place, like wherever you might have seen it, where wherever you might have gone. And and you know, in David the Mind's um, uh, history, of course, like the the commercial was just pumped out. Actually, probably yours too, David, because like the like the 60s, 70s, and 80s is when they really started like pimping the toy market oh, yeah. like really hard and commercial wise just saturated no it's so saturated um but it brings up these nostalgic feelings which is a, what a ton of your movies do for me david i got i gotta say including some that were later that because i had my own kids at this point it was a completely different feeling and i i kept saying this and it's it's the season so um we, we'll get to like the more um horror-esque uh type of movies that i want to talk about as well but like right the same like um like uh curious george um, which you can see the poster if anyone's watching the the video link. Um, the, they can see the Curious George poster behind them, and right. Curious George on PPS is like my was my kid's favorite thing from like the time they were born and still still right now. I I think I even told you that Curious George Boo is still played in my house even when my kids are you know ten six to seven. They're they're a little bit past that you know because Curious George is a very funny um, smaller kids thing. Um, but they still watch it and they still love it. And that like a lot of those songs um, are stuck in my head. How did you get involved with Curious George? Uh, there was an opportunity. Uh, my partner, John Shapiro and I, uh, John, on that project, there was an opportunity to to buy the rights to Curious George. And uh, and we did. We bought it for seven thousand dollars. Wow. I know everybody makes that same face, Tom. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, yes. And um, and this was about 27 years ago. And um, I had I had gone. I never finished college. But when I was at USC um, film school, uh, um, there was a person in my class that happened to be Ron Howard. And we struck up a, a friendship, um, <laughs> you know, not, nothing deep, 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 but, but a friendship. And um, again, this is before he had, you know, directed anything. Um, and you know, he was really just an Opie to the world, but I, um, <laughs> I brought him, uh, he and his partner, Brian Grazer with John, uh, we brought them Curious George and they were so excited. And I thought, oh, Ron will direct it. And, uh, anyway, we tried with a, a, a live action chimp that didn't really work so well. And we, CGI, it was too early in those years to even try that. And so, um, we wound up just doing an animated feature of it, which was, it was good. Well, I don't think it was great. I think it was good, 
Um, Jack Johnson did all the songs on it, and, mm -hmm. and those songs are spectacular, and that really <laughs> raised the, uh, the 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 importance of the film because of what he had done. And I think that album went like quadruple platinum with what he wrote for the, the <laughs> film. I mean, it was it, and it really helped. Anyway, nonetheless, then we had an opportunity to do it for for uh, PBS, and we did that for about fourteen years, and then that moved over to Hulu. And now it's on Peacock, and it's the number one children's show on Peacock. But we are doing a live action, finally, Curious George after all these years. And, wow. uh, and Andrew uh, Adams uh, is writing it, uh, and, and he wrote, and he's writing and directing, and he wrote and uh, directed Shrek 1 and 2. So mm. um, oh. uh, it's really fun and touching and and yeah, I mean, it's not just for little kids now. It's just, it's very much a family movie with a grand adventure. It's, it's okay. First of all, that's probably one of the best investments I've ever heard in my life. And, and right? don't know, it, it has, it has a lot to do with, you know, you guys putting the work into it because obviously when you bought it 27 years ago, the animated movie hadn't come out. The, the, the PBS show was not out. So you built all those things and made all these things, which made it to what it is today. But like, it, it's gigantic. Curious George is, I mean, of course there's the books forever, but those don't, you know, they're, they're books. Uh, the, there's a reason that movies, you know, tend to do a little bit better than books is because people like to sit back and be entertained and, and reading is a chore and i hope anyone saw my quotes right there because people like i know dave and i know don't don't have an aneurysm um I'm about to leave right now yeah please don't please don't <laughs> um david's a, a very very big reader um but that like the work that you put into it and turning into what it is i mean that, that's just phenomenal i i i those pbs cartoons first of all i love pbs because pbs is free to everyone so I, mm -hmm. I found it very honorable that you guys do it there because you could go to Nick Loney. You could have went anywhere you wanted with that, but you decided to go with the public. It, it was actually a correction. Let me, before I start, you know, building up the fire, was that a choice or did you, did you guys have like, Oh, we want to go to PBS or was that just where to end up? Gosh, I, I would love to embrace the altruistic, altruistic reason that you've just given. Um, it, uh, they really made an offer and it was a, a good offer. And, uh, that that really was it. I, I would love Good. to say it was so that the masses could see it without having to pay for it. But um, it really it really was they made the best offer and Universal mm. decided that that made the most sense. And it's, you know, well, it's, it's a business at the end of the day. So we'll just say it's both. Just for your sake, yeah. so, <laughs> it was yeah. a bit of both. Right? Oh, we'll yeah. say it's both. Yeah. <laughs> David's just like, listen, guys, I want to make money, but I also want to help the children. So yeah, we're gonna that's, give that's the and that's that's the story we're sticking that's to. It. But that's the honest answer. Um, the, the, and not only of course, is it like the PBS show, but like, um, like I've mentioned before, curious George boo, um, my, my kids watched it. And I think the, the nice thing about it was it was a good transition because it's not scary, scary, but it's got scary elements or like a uh, scarier elements to it. How um, are your kids? Um, right now at, well, at the time, you know, it was my very first boy. I think she was like three when she first saw it, but now I have a 10 year old, a seven year old and a six year old. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, you know, it's one of those jobs I actually like have always been preparing for. I'm very, um, I'm, uh, I'm very, you know, I, I, I've always liked kids a lot. I'm a very empathetic. So I try to understand what they're going through and I've loved my childhood a lot. So I want, I like watching them go through theirs. Like I don't really play video games anymore, but I love watching my son play video games. I like watching him figure it out and do all sorts of stuff. And then ever so often he'll turn back and be like, Hey dad, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Ask the expert. I'm dad. <laughs> I know things. <laughs> that's, um, that's beautiful. And I, I love what you said about loving your childhood. Cause that's something that I say a great deal. I mean, my childhood was pretty until I was about 14 was really ideal and very, Norman Rockwell and filled with love and uh, adventure. And I remember there was a, a show that's, it's being remade now uh, with Chris Rock. Um, but it was, it was called the wonder years. And yes. uh, in the wonder years, one of the opening passages that, that the, the, that the guy that's looking back on his childhood says is um, they were the kind of years that you could go out on your bike for the entire day and not wind up on the back of a milk carton. And that yes. just really yeah. spoke to me because whoever thought about anything like that, we just went and did. And it, 
seemed so safe. Maybe it wasn't. I, I don't know. <laughs> but um, but it, it was. But it was just. A, I had a very magical childhood, and Halloween had a huge impact on on my childhood. And That's so what I was curious about. Actually, what like what were some of the things that uh, you know Halloween aspect or the spooky? What what was the things that you saw as a child? in that genre of like horror and Halloween that really influenced you as you got older or that um, really changed? It, it, there was something magical that I don't think I would have been able to articulate as a child, but there was a, 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 a coming wind of spookiness and, and the, that, that spookiness was heralded at the end of, of, of that October 31st, by by the by porch lights and the beckoning of of what was to come the mm -hmm. idea that these lights would just begin to come on all over our our magical street of like 27 houses on this cul-de-sac this long cul-de-sac and uh and just when those lights began to come on it, they were they were like like what they were like lighthouses that that mm -hmm. were guiding we as sailors towards a, a port where it would be safe <laughs> and there would be candy and uh, it's just it, it was it was it, it was magical and i i from october 1st on we would start planning what we were going to do to decorate yes. and who we we're going to scare and just <laughs> the whole thing and it just you know it's great because i grow up i i've grown up to basically get paid for doing the same things that my parents got to, called to school for, for me daydreaming or drawing monsters or, you know, just all, all, all of that world that most kids kind of drift away when, when stuff gets boring in, in school. And, and I mean, that's what I get to do today. And so ha Halloween was a real important part of that. That's that's a good kicking off point. Let's um let's let's back up even tiny a little bit tiny a little bit more. Um, where does it all start for you, David? How does it begin? Where do you live? How do you get to where you are today? Um, I grew up in a place called Van Nuys, which was this um, suburb outside Los Angeles. My ninety-two year old mom still lives in the house that I was brought home from the hospital. Oh wow! So I, oh, I refer to it as our, yeah. our family uh, seat. Um, but, but, and it's nothing like that. I promise you that's, it's, it, it's no doubt in Abbey. Um, and, um, and as I said, I grew up on this magical block. Um, my best friend lived across the street and two houses up and we slept at each other's house every weekend. And, uh, and we would, for Halloween, we would create all of this stuff together. And, uh, and every Halloween, I, I call him just to say happy Halloween, because <laughs> just being with him just was just planted seeds that I had no idea had been planted or were growing in me as to how I would make a living as, as a grown up. Um, <laughs> at what point do you become interested in film or is it start off somewhere else? Where does the whole um, artistic journey start for you? Yeah, that ends with yeah. you being uh, being the David Kirshner that we know today. Um, from the time I was about seven, I wanted to make movies. I didn't understand exactly what that meant. My parents took me to see a film called How the West Was Won in a cinema <laughs> at, at the Cinerama Dome for uh, either my or my sister's birthday. And I just remember seeing these credits come up, uh, written by, directed by, produced by. I didn't know what any of that meant. I just knew, like, I just remember looking around that theater and seeing people's expressions as they were watching this. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to make people feel like that. And because it made me feel like that. And so um, I started to borrow my dad's uh, super eight Kodak camera. And I started filming, <laughs> in, including, I would save my money for models of like the Mayflower. I would take my old sandbox that I wasn't using anymore. And I would sculpt a lagoon and put all this stuff and, uh, all of my army men down, even though they were two different time periods, take model glue and have my friend David Anson, who lived across the street, as I said, push me on a garbage dolly and I would film as I set the entire lagoon on fire. I would burn down the garage. That's the truth. I would burn down the garage and I spent about two weeks in my room for that. Um, 
but uh, <laughs> I got the shot. And, uh, it's all the kills, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it did. It looked great, especially from you know a, just a point of view of being very low, and it just you know it. it I still love that stuff. I still get excited when you know when you're a part of a movie and you see what these magicians do to bring this stuff to life, and it still is as thrilling as for, for me as it was when I when I set the Mayflower on fire. You're, you're sitting in your room like a Harry Hausner got, never got grounded yeah, yeah, for his yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aquanauts my ass. <laughs> Mom, oh, that is amazing. Um, so you you obviously at a very young age, like like same with like I feel that's a more reoccurring thing nowadays that everyone says a similar thing. First of all, it's very Spielbergian Spielbergian of you to grab out the Super 8 and just start making your own movies without anything. I love that. That is, you know, that that's it's key of an indie artist, especially is like you do everything you can with nothing and that's with what that's you got yeah exactly with nothing and with i have what plenty of that <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> not a lot of nothing but a bunch of gumption and uh you know a hobo sack behind my back all that type of stuff <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty phenomenal so that that makes me laugh sorry so you you start in film at what year what what year is you like your first like uh your first uh, not big break when's your first introduction to film as a career um well, the first thing that I did or um, whichever, I mean, the okay. first thing you did or like the first thing that like you felt accomplished, you're like, okay, I made something that is film worthy or I took part in something that was film worthy. I, I made one. a little short called The Cookie Jar um, in 1970, I think it was. Um, and, uh, and I got black and white film and I had it sepia toned. And it was just about a kid breaking into a house in the 20s to get um, some cookies that have been baked with his dog. And, uh, and my mom, um, who was very much like Frances McDormand from Almost Famous, you know, dr driving her son everywhere, and which is what she did. Anyway, I entered a film contest with this little short and I won. Oh, wow. I, you had to be 16 to get into the um, film festival. And I was 14 and a half or 14 and three quarters. You and lied so about your age. So, yeah, so they took the award away. Oh. My mom went after them tooth and nail that that they would um, they would penalize a kid that they thought was good enough to win, but because he wasn't old enough, they were going to take this award away. Oh, she went to the newspapers. It was pretty great. And uh, yeah, you know, go, I wasn't ever invited back to be a part of it, but but I, <laughs> I do have the award. So. Oh, that's but you excellent. showed them. Look at your career. You showed them, like, yeah, yeah you fucked up. I'm sure they don't remember me. The <laughs> but, David's, but David's anyway, got a but it, it sure, it sure made me just uh, worship my mom that much more for uh, and and a, a great role model, just this strong female character. Because I, I had lost my dad when I was 14. That's what I was saying. Oh, that shit. my childhood up until 14 I'm sorry to was, hear that. was great, yeah. and my my dad passed away very suddenly uh, in my 14th year. So, uh, you know, and that's childhood came to kind of a crashing end with that because we almost lost the house and, you know, lots of lawn mowing and cleaning up dog poop and washing cars to try to uh, help in whatever way I could do for, for her to keep the house, which I'm proud to say she's, as I said, she's still in. Wow. But, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that, so but these, amazing. These are the things know? that form us, right? You know, yeah. these, these little, these, 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 this to use an analogy of the oyster uh, of just, you know, sand getting in and rubbing and rubbing. And from that, the pearls that are us, uh, any of us on our, our journey um, through, through life. And some times those horrendous situations can really form who you are. I take my dad back in a second, of course, oh, but, of course. Yeah. but they really form who you are. And, Absolutely. Uh, and I think that was really the case uh, case for me. That is beautiful. I, I gotta say, especially because like the, it's such a hard thing. Like growing up is hard enough as it is. You you need positive role models, and one of your you know positive role, mo role models gets removed from your life, and it's like, how do you continue on from there? And a lot of people can just really fall, you know, really far down and just kind of hit rock bottom with that type of situation, even at a young age as fourteen. But instead, it seems like your mom, you and your mom, kind of like okay this is the situation. This is what we got to do. And you made the best of it. And, you know, I mean, to be fair, you came out smelling like roses. You're, you're, one the, you're a prolific producer and writer for goodness sakes. Well, and a lot of people right? can't really stake that claim. That's beautiful. I, I, I have been very lucky. And I, I don't say that with, 
false modesty. When I was in film school, there were people that were so much more talented than I was and so much more worldly than I certainly was. Um, but I, I guess I had enough to attract some attention and people were incredibly kind to me. I, I mean, in a business that is not a kind business that, you know, I often wonder nurture or nature, what brings so many awful people to this business. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that, especially in those years, there were so many people that were just incredibly kind. And um, I mean, I, I, if I can just tell this quick story, um, it's of course, time, man, please. Yeah. The, in, we're here for you. Times. <laughs> there was an article on me in the LA Times that said, Shy Young Daydreamer Makes His Dreams Come True. It was on my first project, I was in my mid 20s at this point. Um, Hallmark and the General Mills Toy Group, which is Hasbro today, um, mm -hmm. were, were my partners on, on this. And um, and anyway, there was this article that said, Shy Young Daydreamer makes his dreams come true. And uh, and one of the people that read that was Kathy Kennedy. Oh, most shit. probably don't even know who Kathy Kennedy is. You guys. They, they but, better. Uh, She's the most prolific female producer ever since ever, ever since ever. <laughs> I mean, and probably the richest. And she started off as Steven's assistant and then Steven Spielberg. And then Steven saw how talented and bright she was and made her a producer and and today she runs all of Lucas film. Uh, when, yes. when George Lucas retired, that's who he named as, as, as his successor to run that company. Anyway, Kathy called me and said, and I had no idea who Kathy Kennedy was at that point. This is 1984 and said, uh, I read this article on you. I'd like to meet you. And, um, and I just showed Hallmark my next project, which was an American tale. And they passed on it because it was too ethnic. I'm Jewish. And it was about my, my American Tale was I'm sorry. American Tale was completely yours. Like I thought. That, okay, so this people please don't let me interrupt you because that's just phenomenal. No, no. no but ask your question. Say, ask your question again. Uh, I, I see. I always thought that, like, um, when I saw the credit, I saw that you're a writer, but I don't know how the process generally goes. I'm just a civilian. So when, um, when I look at it, I'm like, oh, somebody had the idea, and then somebody wrote it, and then Steven Spielberg got behind it, and all that jazz. But you completely made American Tale that that you wrote that and you pitched that, and that was yours. Well, it, yes, it was my story. Wow. Uh, I I worked with Tony Geis and Judy Froenberg when I was at. Um, when I was working with Henson, I was on Sesame Street and they were writers and I, I, they were older than I was and I really just liked them a great deal. And so um, I had suggested to Stephen uh, when he bought the project that this, this, these are people that I think are great. And he went with it and, um, and they, they wrote the screenplay. I'd written 24 pages of the story and I did all my drawings of the characters and I had maquettes which are sculptures of the Mouskowitz family and all these different mice from all over the world because it's a microcosm of the of, of immigration coming mm -hmm. to this country and um but Kathy came to my office and I showed it to her she didn't smile she didn't laugh she just said can I use your phone and in 1984 there were not <laughs> cell phones and I thought oh god <laughs> she's calling a, a taxi cab and I just <laughs> said she worked she worked for Stephen and, uh -huh. and I was thrilled by that. And, uh, but she, she called Stephen and said, that's, that's who she was calling and said, you've got to see this kid's work like now. And Stephen said, you know, kind of the Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. I don't know what he said. <laughs> um, and then she said, okay, okay, okay. And then she got off the phone and she said, Stephen's got a little eye infection or something. But he's having a, uh, a 4th of July party tomorrow, July 4th, 1984. Uh, why don't you come to the house, bring your wife. Um, I want you to bring all of this. Come maybe half an hour before, show Stephen this, and then, uh, and you know, and stay for the party. So I had gone from never being invited to any Hollywood party to being invited to a party that over there is Sean Connery, over there is Harrison Ford, and there's Jeffrey Katzenberg. And it's just like, I mean, you know, I was just with both my wife and I with our mouths open <laughs> anyway, but I was so nervous to meet Steven. I mean, you know, Spielberg 1984 is still East. Spielberg. Oh, he's still, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> that summer. Uh, pulled yes, guys. of course. <laughs> oh, know. yeah, it's right. John. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna... Yeah. So um, I walk in and, and my wife and I are carrying a steamer trunk because I had all my uh, my drawings in there. I had um, the maquettes in there when the top of the steamer trunk which is what the immigrants would come over right to America. They would have their steamer trunks. When the steamer trunk was open, an American flag came out and I had, <laughs> and I had a little cassette player that with Neil Diamond is they're coming to America. And I, and I pushed that. I mean, all so easy, but it touched Stephen. And, um, and when I walked in, when I first walked in with Liz, my wife and Stephen's there, and I see him, he's got the kind of cliche baseball hat, the cliche Spielberg yep. baseball hat. But he's wearing. Glasses. Uh. Yeah, the glasses. <laughs> and he's, he's on a Looney Tunes rug in his bare feet. He's, he's, at, the, he's at the beach. And uh, the entire, this entire home at that point was decorated in the most amazing animation cell collection I had ever seen. Wow. Uh, from Snow White, from Bambi, just the most amazing things. And I felt right at home I mean, because here was a geek just like me that mm -hmm. loves all of that stuff. Anyway, I proceeded to present it to him. And it was truly after my wife told me she loved me and and uh, and uh, us giving birth to our, our children and now grandchildren um, wow. watching that. It was the greatest moment in my professional life, for sure, because Stephen said, what excites me more than what I see before me is what you still have up there. And as you mature in this business, how it will come out. And then he leaned over and said something that no one has ever said since. And that is, let's turn this into a movie. And it was that easy. And it has never been as easy as that moment. But the way that I'm, I'm looking at you guys right now, if, if, if you're both Spielberg, just behind you, about five feet, is my wife, who, as I'm glancing over Stephen's shoulder, is weeping. And weeping, and I'm so I kind of feel like crying right now, dude. Shit, this crazy lady <laughs> crying on his, <laughs> on his couch. Um, but she was just so proud and so thrilled that Sir Spielberg, the man that she loved, my wife and I met when we were 16 on an archaeological dig in the Negev Desert in the Middle East. And, what? and, and That's we, crazy. Are, we are inseparable. I mean, we've been married 44 <laughs> years, and uh, you know, we we each came to into this relationship. Her parents were survivors of the concentration camps, oh, a child taken out of their arms and murdered, you know, the numbers on their arms. And, you know, we, we both had kind of more difficult childhoods than most of the people that we would begin to hang out with. And, mm -hmm. um, and it really formed us. She's a very brilliant MBA. And I, uh, you know, I've never, I've never written a check in my life. I don't know how to balance a checkbook. I'm, and Liz, Liz is the truly the grown up in the relationship. <laughs> Let's me go into a room like this and draw monsters and creatures and and dream. And I'm I'm enormously <laughs> blessed to say the least to uh, to have this soul in my life for all these years. But, That's really uh, beautiful. But that that was a really exciting day, and uh, and an American Tale became American Tale one and two, and then a uh, direct-to-video and then uh, uh, movies, a series of those, and then uh, uh, a television series uh, on, on uh, animated television series, and then two different playlands at both Universal uh, mm. uh, Hollywood and Florida. And just, wow, just to have to see my children play in that, it's kind of so that brings you to tears. I, I love American Tale, period. Like, uh, the oh, first yeah. one is is a very... It's it's a great movie to it gives you representation of what it's like to come to America. It's really cool. I love that the fact that you know it shows the Statue of Liberty in its bronze. It's it's very beautiful. But Five Will Goes West was my jam. I don't know what the difference is between the two. Maybe it's a it's much just, bigger adventure for sure. Yes, absolutely. Like um, between the between um, oh man, what's his name? Hold on here. I, I Tiger between uh, Tiger becoming like uh, the sheriff with wild burp and all that stuff, dude. Like yeah, good uh, I, uh, do you remember Thank who the you. voice was on I've Wiley? Um, uh, no, I remember that. To even pay attention to it. It was the last movie that Jimmy Stewart would ever make. Uh, Whoa! That, that what? Wow! Yeah, I know. That's not wow. weird. And when wow. I'm just giving myself goosebumps because when he rides off into the sunset at the end, I yes. always weep because it's Jimmy Stewart, and it will be the last movie that he ever did with all the great John Ford westerns that he did do. Mm -hmm. And and here he is. Uh, in 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 
in a world of characters that I had had a lot to do with creating and 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 others. Don Bluth added a great deal. Stephen certainly added a huge amount, as Kathy did. So many people, but it was something that I had created for our daughters originally. And here and here is Jimmy Stewart in that movie, and it just wow, it just it kills me. Damn. I just. Uh, <sighs> Okay, so we're already like because this is just such a magical thing. This is already going really, really too fast for me. Okay, um, it's Halloween <laughs> season. Um, that's the whole reason I, I got you on to begin with. Let's let's get to the Halloween stuff. Okay. How on? Uh, so did you, was it your idea for Hocus Pocus? The most like the biggest Disney Halloween movie ever. Period. Like if, I don't know anyone that does not watch Hocus Pocus on Halloween. That's that's crazy talk to me. The, as soon as my yeah. daughter was old enough to watch it, we had her watch it. Like every single. Um, vault of Disney or every single time it was Saturday Night Disney, whatever it might be, they always play like clips of different movies and Hocus Pocus is always right there. At least the cat Binks was. How does that become a thing? Was, was that you? Was that somebody else? Where's that come from? Uh, it was a story that I'd written for our daughters again. I just wow. um, yeah and um, they, they were, you know, I think at that point they were uh, uh, about six and four and there were big kids on the street that were like 12 and I <laughs> took photos of these kids with band, um, toilet paper bandoleros uh, around <laughs> them. And that never made it into the Disney version. They thought that was, I guess, too naughty. Uh, oh, that they, well, okay. um, you know, they, yeah, they, they kind of uh, clean things up. Um, and, and my original story was darker than, than what Ooh. made it onto the air. But it, uh -huh. I mean, it should be said, and I, I always want to be the first one to say this. Hocus Pocus is the worst reviewed film of my career. It barely, it bar it's 34% on Rotten Tomatoes. It barely made any money. It came out against Jurassic Park in July. Oh, shit. <laughs> a, terrible time, a terrible time to release a Halloween movie. And I thought that was it. And I was in tears over it because that story meant so much to me. And about five years later, uh, Disney threw it up one October as just one film. And there was a nice response to it. So the next year they did it a couple more times and an even a bigger response and they kept doing it. And I honestly, I, I thank whoever was in charge of programming at the Disney channel because that really began to grow an audience for it. And mm. today it's, it's an amazing uh, show in Florida at the, uh, at Disney world. It's just yes. incredible. And it sells out every year um, except last year, obviously there was yeah. no uh, there was no anything Disney last year, any of the parks. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it uh, it's going to Broadway. We're doing the sequel oh, to oh. it. Um, and, uh, and Kenny Ortega, the director, brought so much to it. I, at, at one of the key moments, and again, one of the things that I love being very honest about was when I was told that they were going to do this musical number called I Put a Spell on You in the middle yes. of it. I said, you can't do that. Here, <laughs> kids have like the... the, the the genie out of the bottle and look what's going to happen to the kids of Salem. You can't stop it with a musical number. And Kenny kept assuring me, I'm telling you, this will be everybody's favorite moment. And I just was so positive. He was wrong. And I was so wrong. It was <laughs> such a great moment. And what he did with it, as he did the whole film, he just brought just a, a feeling of just such humor and camp to it. Um, that that between the idea in a Disney movie of 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 witches that are going to suck the lives out of little children, not a, you know <laughs> typically not a, a Disney theme, and oh. um, but you know that combination really really made it happen. And I always say this about films: it takes a village. You know, for any mm. of those people that you spoke about at the beginning with with those their heads so filled with uh, with their ego, um, nice. it you know there's so many talented people that put so much into all of these movies that I, that I'm always a little uncomfortable to say, yes, I did that when the truth was so many people did that. But a lot of these, yes, were my original stories that then became so much better than anything I ever created because of what they added. What, what do, what was, I, I got to ask, what was darker about your version of Hocus Pocus? Like That's, what made yes. well, it, yeah, it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near as, as funny. I mean, I, I like to think that I could be funny, but it, my but the story here was that these were just pure evil witches, which they are, but they're 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 sillier and um, and uh, 
my, my dear friend uh, Mick Harris wrote uh, the screenplay for it, and then a guy named Neil Cuthbert came in and added even more humor to it. And, uh, you know, I think all of those things, all of us building upon each other is, is really what made it sing for people. But there's a nostalgia about it, and it's what, when I oh, speak yeah. about porch lights coming on, it's, the whole movie is filled with that, and it's really... It's really like a, a Hallmark card from the 40s um, yes. with its palette. The the thing is, though, is like you set a standard for Halloween that I think is almost um, uh, intangible. I got to say, I like the the amount of kids that are around there. I grew up in a big neighborhood. So like that reminds me of my neighborhood. All the kids walking around all over the place. Um, where, um, where the thing that? is. I grew up in, um, I'm, I was born in New York. I'm from, uh, I lived in Colchester, Vermont, which is next to Burlington, Vermont, um, okay. the big major city in Vermont. And uh, we, we had a huge block. It's very populated. So we had block connected to block, connected to block, connected to block, like going for long distances. So you could spend two, three hours trick or treating and only go within like a five mile radius. It was very, very cool. Um, but the Halloween party, the Halloween party that they show at the town hall is epic it's like you know everything you want as an adult in a halloween party everyone dresses up they're all having a good time there's good music there's dancing and me and my wife went to this monster bash a couple years back we bought tickets for 50 dollars. and the first thing we said to one another was it's just like hocus pocus oh my god and that made our night so the, the standard that you set with your writing sir is is just something to live up to that i think everybody wants to have on their halloween we're we're very we're very proud of that and it's you know it's like pinch me time that you can create something or write something for your kids that means so much to you and be able to sell it to Disney. And then, you know, for it to fail, which it did, and then for it to come back and it just, you know, it's just, it's bigger than it's ever, ever, ever been. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it moves me. It moves me to tears very often. I, I, every time there's a screening of the film, my wife and I sit with John Debney, who wrote that magnificent score, and he wrote that in two weeks because James wow. Horner, the great composer, and he and I had done like five films together and had a wonderful friendship. But um, James got an offer to do another film, which was Titanic, <laughs> and, and, and left us. So the only thing that, as a favor, he wrote one song, which was for Sarah Jessica Parker called Come Little Children. And yeah, it's it's yes. you know when she's luring them in her siren way, and um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so uh, but John wrote this, and we sit, and at the end of that film, we each hold hands with each other, and when when we watch it, you know, we'll we'll speak at different events, and and they'll show the film, and we hold hands and cry together because it <laughs> moves us so much. Um, the experience that we had uh, on that. That is fucking beautiful, man. Yeah, it is. So, it, it, it's it's there's some really beautiful relationships came out of there, and Thora Birch, who played the little girl Danny, and it remains a dear friend, and you know she's a magnificent actress she was then, but she's that much more, and uh, she's I'm I'm not sure if this is even announced yet, but I'm going to go for it. She's about to be in Tim Burton's live action version of the Adams Family, which I'm so excited about. I think Whoa. that was announced. So I think you're safe. I think that was announced. That. <laughs> all right that sounds good so, uh, but sorry yes. my uh my huh? kid likes to roll up and he's like i need a cord for my laptop and i'm like <laughs> I, 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 this is not the time please I love did you notice know, this is it, the perfect time i'm the perfect person to do that with believe me uh, I all right, cool. I'll bring him back on. He can do the rest of the interview. Then we'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> Ends up being our highest rated podcast. I'm like, what the hell? He's already <laughs> usurped my throne of podcasting. Um, that is okay. That is just amazing. One, I got, I got to say, like it, it, the fact that like it became such a cult classic, and that's what mm. it is. It is a cult classic at this point. You, you mentioned Hocus Pocus to almost anyone that loves Halloween. They're like, oh my god, right? And yeah. you'll meet plenty of people that watch it without it being Halloween. And, it, and I, I expect there was a phone call to Spielberg being like, come on, man, really? You have to drop Crichton's movie on me right now. I'm trying to do a thing about witches. <laughs> no, no there, there was not. There, there was not. But I will tell you, Stephen was very upset at me. And it was just naivete on my part. I had presented an American tale to Disney. They passed on it. Um, Jeffrey mm -hmm. Katzenberg said, who the F is going to go see a film about a Jewish mouse? I and did. I said, <laughs> and I said, well, who's going to see a film about a wooden puppet? It's what oh, you do with that character and where you where you take the arc of 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 the emotions of that story. 
And he wrote me a great note afterwards that I still have that says, Dear David, now I know who the F is going to go see a film about a Jewish mouse, Muscle Tough. That was a class act on, on his part. But, uh, but uh, he deserves a lot of credit. But he just said, Is there anything else? We blew it with an American tale. And I said, Well, I have this story that I, I wrote for my daughters. He said, Well, bring it in and pitch it. And so I love to set a stage. I love to make executives, female, male, I just love to make them 10 years old again. And they walked into the room. I had the lights off, even though it was daytime, but it was so the room was, I won't say spooky, but it wasn't well lit. And I had I had gotten in there earlier and I hung on monofilament wire a broom and a mop and then a hollowed out Electrolux vacuum cleaner hanging from the ceiling. And um, and I my wife bought a, a like 20 pounds of candy corn and we filled a, a, a bag of, of, of like a grocery bag in it and I ripped the bottom and I kind of made a serpent, excuse me, a serpent design right in front of where the execs were going to sit because candy corn smells like your childhood. It's Halloween, yes. right? I, I mean, love candy corn more than anything, you know, yeah. of all that corn syrup and all those horrible things for you, but it's, it's your childhood in a scent and mm. in a sec. And um, and they walked in and I proceeded to say that Halloween is a billion dollar business. And today it's a $10 billion business. I'm not sure Jeffrey even heard the rest of what my story was. He just heard a billion dollar business and that this is something Spielberg hadn't seen yet and, and that he had passed on an American tale. I think those elements, because of the Spielberg pixie dust on me, yeah. um, he just bought it in the room. But Stephen wow. was so hurt that I would not have brought it to him. And I felt horrendous. I mean, I honestly, I didn't even think about it. I just mm. thought, I mean, afterwards, I just thought, oh, I, I can't believe that he's upset. It's just a little Halloween movie. But, you know, he had given me this enormous break. And here I was, I was insensitive enough not to bring it to him. And not that I, I even thought about it, but I was so naive in this business. Mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly like not knowing you that well, Dave, honestly, I just met you, but I feel like the sense that I get from talking with you that you didn't want to bother him maybe with, you I, know, that's exactly what it was. I felt that I was so lucky with, with that one thing. And this is Spielberg and this is a little Halloween movie and a story that I've written my, my children. I never even thought about taking it to a studio. I mm -hmm. just, in, in the beginning, it was just there. It was just one of those, you know, weird little bedtime stories that I would tell them. We were kind of, uh, we, we always joke that we're kind of like the Adams family, but you know, we, we play <laughs> hide and go freak and I would turn on the fireplaces in the house and scary music. And then I would have to find the kids in this great old house, old for LA, 1920. And, oh, yeah, um, and you know, they love that. And, you know, this was just part of that world. So the idea of, Anyway, if I had a time machine, I would certainly go back and show it to Stephen. Though Disney <laughs> um, has done an amazing job these days so with it. You're very, very right. Um, on Ron, but this is we play a game called Al's Game on Wednesday Night Live. It's our live game that we play. And the thing that we've tend to notice is that the audience score is really what matters. Like the mm -hmm. score that Ron Tomatoes gives, that's that's all political in my per, my my personal opinion. Like it's a lot of bullshit, and they they try to make it feel edgy and like we're dissing good movies the score for our hocus pocus 38 percent. whatever it's not that great this audience score is 71 percent. that means almost you know more than double pretty much think that that movie's fantastic and ron tomatoes is full of shit and i tend to agree with the audience score so wow that's i didn't know that thank you <laughs> oh absolutely it's it, well it's it's because it's reflecting on people that actually go on take the time out of their busy schedule and write reviews for it so the 71 percent that wrote that was positive was you know obviously the fans of the film which is everyone once again if i brought my wife in here right now and just be like hey that's what she'd be like oh my god she would just kind of like get all of it but we we have we're, we're running even short on time okay last halloween thing before we get the heck out of here um child's play one of my favorite films of all time i i One showed it to my daughter terrified me yeah my, my daughter is uh 10 like i said she's 11 this year but like when i'm deciding to show her certain things of my past like i love um i, I was really big into monster monster vision joe bob briggs when you do the tnt um movie night every saturday night he'd play horror movies right. it was excellent um and he had this really cool southern noise like hey we're gonna watch a little bit child's play right here and it was excellent so um <laughs> child's play means a lot to me it was one of the first ones that i kind of recognized i think i bought that on vhs um right after once i started getting horror movies how the heck does that come about child's play the the, the series the movies the the amazing movies 
uh, I had been in London with my wife um, and uh, I bought a book called The Victorian Dollhouse Murders. And when I was a kid, there was a episode of Twilight Zone that terrified me called Talking Tina. Um, yes. That's, uh, and, and I just thought I, I'd love to do something with a doll. After An American Tale, people only wanted me, my, my managers, my agents, the, if, my mother, they just wanted me to do another nice animated film. And I really <laughs> wanted to prove that I could do something scary. And because it's a world that I, I love. And when I got back, I gave it to my development person, this, this book, the Victorian Dollhouse Murders, and said, I would love to do something with the doll. And she said, there had been a, a, a screenplay that went out about six months ago called Blood Buddy by a young writer named Don Mancini, very young. I think Don was 22 at the time. And, um, and I read it, and I, the overall idea I really loved. There were things in it that made no sense to me at all um but it, it had been passed on at every studio in town again here i have this spielberg pixie dust on me um that that tends to stick for a little while and um and so i did my drawings of what i thought this this doll should look like in its in its um sweet form and in its terrifying form and um and i just created some things that were not in don's original piece I mean, the world is created by Don and he's brilliant and we have been the, the best of friends and, uh, and partners for, God, he just said this to me yesterday and it shocked me, 35 years. Wow. Um, um, <laughs> and, and he's, uh, well, we, but Don, it's really Don, um, the Chucky series is about to drop on October 12th yes. and uh, Don directed the first episode, was the showrunner which was a first for him. He had never been a showrunner who was responsible for everything. And he was uh, up in Toronto. And uh, just, he, again, he just knocked it out of the park. And Don is a very proud gay man. And um, and I am proud to say that we, we really were the first franchise, horror franchise, to have gay characters in it. We were the first to have um, a, a gay monster in it who is uh, Chucky's... Uh, and Tiffany's son, Glenn or Glenda, depending on where she is in that day, or <laughs> he is in that day. And, um, and in the new piece, Don has written about the high school experience. I'm positive through his own eyes of being 14, 15 years old in high school. And in this case, being gay and then drop Chucky into that world and what begins to happen. He, Don just, he did such a great job on it. And, um, so we're, we're very, very excited about that. And uh, for your listeners, I, anybody that loves the, 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 the Chucky franchise, I think you'll mm. really, really enjoy this. Jennifer Tilly's back. Um, oh, excellent. I oh, good. Brad, much more away, but, um, is, uh, is Brad Dorff back for the voice? Of course. Brad Dorff is, <laughs> he's Brad family. you know, he's been there oh. as long as Don and I. I, I love. Okay, and his daughter so, has now joined us. I don't know if in the last. Yes, two yes. Months, she, she was in yes, the cult of Chucky. Dorf, yes who was yes. in uh, Chris Nolan's uh, last film. And I mean, she's so talented. Um, so she's in it and yeah, I don't, I, I shouldn't give anything I, away, the, here, but um, I, I love Brad Dorf the deaf and I, I'm a big fan of, um, I like Deadwood, the television uh, show. Yeah, actually, yeah. The poster's right here and I had nothing to do with it, but it's here because <laughs> our older daughter um, designed the uh, um, created the poster for Deadwood and it was oh. the first major, major project. So I keep it up in my office. And wow. the prostitute that's on the front holding <laughs> little gold and her head is turned away is our younger daughter. So, oh, get out of here. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So that's just a coincidence that that would happen and the Brad would be in it. But, um, yeah, because he is he has such an he has such an iconic voice. Like when you hear Brad Dorff, doesn't really yeah. all you have to hear is the scream. The scream is where I always can tell. Like um, when I was when I watched Urban Legend for the first time, I didn't realize that was Brad Dorff until he screamed. There's someone in the back seat. I was like, that was Chucky. And yeah. of course, it's it's very oh my god, he gives me yeah, chills. no, and he's but, in in uh, um, the Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, Wormwood is his character, and yes. that, and he's evil and horrible. He's a great actor. I remember, he can't he's a phenomenal nominee actor. For Billy from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Just uh, oh, wow. just an amazing career. 
Long so before your time. <laughs> what what works extremely well about Child's Play, the original, and don't worry, I love all of them. I really do. Like my daughter, she loves number three the most. I, I'm a huge fan of Bride of Chucky. It came out um, when I was like 12, 13 or something along those lines. That I had that soundtrack forever. I think it's one of the greatest soundtracks, period. Um, right next to the Days of Confused soundtrack. Just so much good music involved. Uh, um, the, the, I can't wait to tell Don you said that because that soundtrack, they mean something to both of us, but he lives and breathes horror soundtracks and he's he's truly like sitting with martin scorsese but specific to horror i mean he knows everything about every <laughs> film about horror he's just he's really a fascinating interview if you ever choose to do that oh i would love you should get him on yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. okay so uh, when you're ready let me know and i'll help you with that Oh my God! Yes, yes please. Yes, we have it we'll recorded. You said it. Yes, we'll take it. Yeah, yeah. It's all video. <laughs> David, thank <laughs> you. This, David. Um, so, okay, so the reason that it works so amazingly well, it's very Jaws like, right? Like, there's an introduction to it where it's a big introduction, which is um, the the character that is Chucky, um, Charles Lee Ray, um, getting killed, and then after that, you don't really see chucky until like three quarters of the way through the movie and then it's chucky madness and it's all about the seeing the doll murder people and stuff which is the same thing about jaws and i understand that there's a difference but that being that jaws they had to do it out of necessity because the shark didn't work so they couldn't show the stuff they want to do which old made bruce. them which old bruce which gave that really good uh shark's view which worked extremely well and same thing with child's play with chucky chucky you see like the chucky view or yeah, like it's like that just yeah, it, it's it's perfect. Did, was that intentional? Did you guys, um, uh, I I, I want to send you an edible fruit basket for setting me up with that question. Let me tell you, <laughs> uh, the the guy that directed the first Chucky, talented guy, uh, Tom Holland, but um, difficult uh, from my point of view, very difficult. I went from animation to a world of um, '80s filmmaking. I won't go much further than that, but I'll let you. <laughs> slide in whatever you would like to slide in there and it would be yep. appropriate. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, uh, um, but um, I kept saying to him, you're showing the doll too much. And I, look, you know, this was my first live action film. This is a guy that had done it a bunch of times. It was a really great writer. His, his, his psycho too is brilliant. Um, yes. But uh, he just, he would do this to me. And I, I was intimidated by the guy. I mean, Today, that would not be the case, but, you know, when, when I was in my later 20s and I had never been on a live action set before, uh, that, oh, that I, I, was, I was intimidated. And he just kept saying, OK, thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I guess I, one day I did it one too many times. And, uh, and I, again, I would never yell it across. The, today, I still wouldn't do that. I, you know, I'm very, very, very respectful of, of the director. But I guess I did it one too many times and it really pissed him off. And I started to walk away and said, hey, David. And he picked up his coffee cup and hurled it at my head. Uh, of course, whoa. the coffee cup. It missed. The, uh, the coffee didn't hit me, but, but the, the cup missed and hit a wall and then fell on the floor and shattered. Um, and I don't know what it was, but I snapped and I went running at him and threw him against the, the wall, except... Fuck it's a yeah. puppet movie, so you build rafters, so you're six feet up, and they're not walls. We went right through. <laughs> which, is, which is, I don't know how to fight, but that's a great move. You know, yeah, it is. You land on somebody and knock their wind out. Um, anyway, it was it was bad. The next day, he brought a uh, a, a pistol uh, and said, hey, David, listen, about yesterday, and he turned around and he fired it at me. It was a blank gun, but I'll tell you, I almost wet my pants. I mean, it scared me so much. Wow. Uh, he was eventually let go from the film after he turned in his cut of it. And then we proceeded to knock off 32 minutes of stuff that was unnecessary for the exact reason that you very astutely, Tom, just said in Jaws, in Alien. It, it, yes. It's, you know, you build up to that. Yes. And, um, and he was too in love with the doll. And there are plenty of times that the doll was not working as well. Kevin Yeager did the puppeteering and did a phenomenal job, but it was our first film. And, you know, we're always rushing and there's, it's, it's mechanics. There's always things that are going to break down. And um, anyway, uh, so that's, that's, that's why we, we went um, to, to that point and cut 30 minutes, 32 minutes out of the film so that it was really 
pushed to the other side, the, the back end of the film. And that's when Chucky goes crazy and we see him and, yes. um, you know, you, you build up to it. And well, the, the reaction. Okay. First of all, th th thank you for saying all those nice things. Cause that is just amazing. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> but I always felt that it works best the way it is because like, he's such an explosive personality. This Charles Lee Ray as a character, right? He's he, he, in the beginning, he's, he's like using voodoo to like keep himself alive. He's screaming at the cops. He feels, he feels like he's untouchable because he's unkillable. And he remains quiet, like as a quiet, like conscious voice to this little child to like convince him to do the things he wants him to accomplish. And then at the, near the end with the mom, Mom just had it enough. Like she's she's losing her mind. She thinks that her son's crazy. She thinks she's crazy. And then she finds out that the Chucky doll has no batteries in it. And she threatens to throw the thing in the fire. And he all of a sudden turns and he's like, You stupid. And that's <laughs> brilliant. That's a great piece of cinematography right there. And the fact yes. is, it would have been way, uh, the, wasted. The, the cinematographer is Bill Butler, who shot Jaws. Oh yeah, oh, that, oh, yeah. Do I work so that well. Okay. <laughs> Shit. Yes. And, Amazing. And I was able to use him again, even though he was probably closer to eighty at this point on uh, a, a film that I made called Frailty, and uh, and uh, and he did such a great job, and the great Bill Paxton directed that and started yes. it with Matthew McConaughey. Uh, so okay. So we were actually talking about this. That's the only film. Like, it was a big uh, uh, movie store film. Like, I saw Frailty right there. And I'm like, I got to watch that. But I never made it to that. So, like, I, I really feel like now I have to watch it. Because we were talking about I'm Like, that's the only movie me and David have not seen in your entire list. Like, we got to see that movie, apparently. It's, it's a, um, it's, it's, it, it's truly, I, I didn't write the screenplay. So I can say this. A very talented writer named Brent Hamley wrote it. And, you know, it's. It's a difficult subject. I mean, it's children, murder in the name of God, you know, the way that one son views a, a, a dad as a hero and the other one thinks he's a psycho and Bill directed it and starred as the character of, of dad. It's, I mean, it's often compared to um, uh, Brian Singer's film, uh, <laughs> Usual Suspects, because of a very surprise uh at the oh, end, cool. um, a big, big turn there. And, um, but boy, Bill did an amazing job directing that film. And it's something, it's a film I'm really proud of because we made it for very little and boy, he, he did a great I'm, job. I'm going to watch it. Like, um, yeah. I have uh, the next two days off. I'm going to watch for LT now. I'll just go well, Amazon please, it really quick. Please, please write me and let me know your honest assessment of the film. Oh, I will. Hate it, I want to know that too. All right, I, sounds good. I, I'm such an easy, I'm, I'm I such an easy date. You could, you can buy me popcorn and just throw it at me, and I'll be like, "That's a great day, David. I loved it." I'm really easy I, with film. I, I, man. I had to have LAPD protection because of that film, because Whoa. there were fundamentalists on the extreme right that wanted, as they said, to put a bullet in my head, and it was really scary. You're the and nicest the guy in the world. Basically, honestly, if you're a religious person, the God of the First Testament is a very smoting deity. I yeah, mean, he is. You know, whether it's earthquakes or and the ground pillars of salt, or turning you into right. salt, or you know, or or pieces of, uh, of 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 walls come tumbling down on you. I mean, and and then that's what Brent Hamley was inspired by. Uh, that's another whole story, but it but it, <laughs> it, it, it it's something that uh, that that's a uh, I, I I'm so proud to be a part of that film with with the filmmakers that were part of it. That is phenomenal. Now I have something to look forward to. I'm going to watch Hocus right. Pocus tonight just so when your name comes up, I, I, I just talked to him. Look at that. Be proud of like, I know him. Proud I know dad. him. <laughs> kind of. Okay. Uh, David, I, I got to say, man, I, I I really want you to come back on again. Like really, really badly. I, I, I would love the, to. This has been so great. And what's the difference is, is your partner British? That's normally yes. on with you? Yes. So you talk about the culture of both worlds. and Yes. Because I'm a complete Anglophile. And tomorrow you are? my wife would say yes. And and our kids and grandkids. In one second, I would move 30 minutes outside of London in a, in a second. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, next time that you come on, I, uh, <laughs> Alex has got to be on. Yeah. Alex is going to wet his pants. He's like, no, I missed that interview. Like, sorry, you were at Oktoberfest. I'm so sorry. Did you get? Um, which he was very. He really wanted to be here. But David, thank you so much for for picking up the slack again. David, like me and Alex have been burning out a little bit, but um, because we've been doing it for almost four years nonstop, we haven't taken a break since we started. We do it every wow. single week, even twice a week. In Alex's That's case, three to four times. Um, yeah. So we're taking a break in November. Um, we're going to come back for December. 
Um, but uh, David, first of all, I, I I'm, I'm going to continue to talk to you because I would love to uh, re- I, I would love to talk to Don. I think that'd be phenomenal. I'd, I'd love to set that up down the road. Um, I would I need to talk to you some more. You your career is not we barely scratched the the, the <laughs> first most crust of your career like right. the Flintstones behind you, which I love <laughs> as a kid. There's so much more that you've done that I we haven't gotten into, and I really really want to talk to you about. But I gotta say, sir, you are a gentleman you are a scholar the the fact that your career went the way it did is 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 it's breathtaking and it's reassuring that even if you're a good person you can still make amazing art because there's always that you know um there's always that chestnut that you know uh, that uh, misery makes art and all that type of stuff and of course you know 14 year old you had a very bad thing happen a horrible thing something that we hope never happens to anyone but the yeah. fact is that you 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 turn it into this gold mine that is like your art and it just keeps on going and i i once again i i i'm so grateful for you as a person as a creator and i'm very grateful for you coming on talking to us today oh it, absolutely it, it touches me that you even had me on the show and boy it's been fun it's you know it's like a sleepover with <laughs> three friends <laughs> and just staying up all night talking about the stuff that you love right you know movies absolutely. and things that go bump in the night <laughs> absolutely so um do you want to do? Uh, do you want to do later lounge today, David? Are you cool with the interview? What do you want I'm, to do? Do you want to? I'm cool. But it's up to you, man. I'm I'm sticking around. Okay. Well, um. So generally, what we do now is we let our guests leave because you know you you have things to do, and we we go into later lounge, which is just us catching up on uh, whatever might have happened during the week, whatever things coming up. It we gives us time to promote the next things that are coming up. Um. But uh, have I been saying your last name right? This is a really bad time to ask. I've been, it's a it's Kirshner, right? <laughs> it's Kirshner. Yes. All right. Yeah, cool. I don't look like an idiot then. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll just take that part. Anyways, um, so guys, this is our first installment of the spooky Halloween October month. That is my favorite month, October, of course. Um, oh, yeah. And our first amazing guest, uh, guest, please let's all you know say thank you to Mr. David Kirscher. Thank you very much. Man. Thank you so thank much you for coming guys. on. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Really fun. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, I'll stay in contact, David. Thank you very much, friend. Thank you. Thank Take you care. again. Happy Halloween. Happy, Happy Halloween. Halloween <laughs> Take sir. care. Take care and the family. Bye bye. Yeah, you, yours were yours as well. Thank you. All right, <sighs> let's. Wow. All right, let's. Let me get the later lounge brought up. Uh, taxi. You know, if that Uber driver looked at me again, I swear I was gonna have to go up there and give him an HJ because he's so good looking. What a good looking guy. I mean, he didn't he didn't, you know, he didn't really say that he wanted me to, but he's giving that look, right? You know <laughs> they give me a hand job while I'm driving this car look. I've never seen that, but sure. <laughs> Oh, we've all seen it, David. We just don't admit that we've seen it. Wow. Wow. I gotta say, man, like what an amazing guest holy shit dude. i'm still like my head's kind of like still spinning i'm still like you know like post gasp of everything that he's done and like yeah. all the sh- you know the, the people that he's met and like he's just his amazing career it's just like what like all those like what wow like i just i'm out of oh, gasps yeah. you know like fuck oh yeah it, it, i know right it's like how much more stuff can you say that <laughs> make me say <gasps> <gasps> like, yeah. if, if, if anyone's watching the video like it's it's different when you listen when you listen it might just sound like me and david is making utterances but if you watch uh-huh. the video me and david are just getting like closer and closer i'm like get the fuck out of here that too and like what really what the fuck? out of breath out of sheer astonishment of everything that he's done just having such a really good person him being so like you know nice and loving and everything like that dude to be able to create wonderful things that were what essentially based off you know his, his daughter or his children but yes. that he was able and had the opportunity to share with the world and have it become something much more phenomenal was it's just so incredible and for him to still have that just you know be a, a good sense person of wonder yeah yes. oh man it's just it it Dude, warms your he, heart he made fucking hocus pocus for his kids on a whim a yeah. fucking like and that's that makes me mad that people do not understand the brilliance of hocus pocus right off the bat because it, it 
an essential Halloween film. It really is. But now I know a bit more of the background. I'll be like, how fucking dare you mock Hocus Pocus? That guy wrote it for his daughter. Show some goddamn he, respect. He, yeah. Right, right. The American tale just to basically <sighs> outline like the struggles that people went through to get across to the, dude, it's fucking beautiful. And the fact that Steven Spielberg's and Kathy Kennedy saw the brilliance in this man. I mean, mm-hmm. David deserves everything and more. And not yeah. only that, he has enough foresight to buy fucking curious George. Yeah. Fucking amazing! Like, what the what the <laughs> fuck is that all about? Like, I've never once looked at a character and be like, "Yeah, that'll be that'll be something." <laughs> that's worth like, an investment. That's so, worth you know, seven thousand dollars, which I'm sure, like, I didn't want to poke out. I'm like, how many millions you make off Curious George? Now, be right? real, like, you Shit. must make a fucking mint off Curious George. Just merchandise alone, you're making a killing. And he's like <sighs> sitting there, he's, he's taking up a bunch of He's like, I don't know, I'm just really sweaty right now. <laughs> 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 oh my god. <laughs> That was phenomenal. You did amazing, David. I gotta say, dude, it never ceases to amaze me. Like you, you always bring in the questions I never think to think about. And I love it when you and me have like a similar thought. Like when I was when I was asking about the darker side of Hocus Pocus, you're like I was gonna ask that. I was like, yes, yeah. me and him, we got it, we got the same because like, singularity. I definitely, obviously, you know, having a guest on is like you know as prestigious as him, who had you know unbeknownst to him had like such a profound impact on my childhood. Makes oh, me yeah. question his childhood. Like you know, what was it? Like you know that. What ha- Halloween aspects of your childhood that really sort of you know, what were your favorite horror movies growing up as a kid? What were the things that terrified you or something like that? You know, um, and I absolutely and I really enjoy the fact that he enjoyed us. Like that's my favorite thing. It's like and doing interviews great. It really is. Getting to speak to David was just phenomenal. But when David said at the very end that he enjoyed our company, that makes me the happiest of all because I don't uh, like the same way that he feels like he shouldn't have been like hanging out with Spielberg. That's the yeah. way I feel about <laughs> almost all of our guests. I'm like I have no right to hang out with basically. You right now. But I yeah. think our all of our dynamics, yours, uh, Alex's, and mine, like you know, I think just the way we all sort of work together, and we're all forming our own little, like, you know, collective, like funny group. Like, yes, we are very curious and interested in what people do for a living and what brought up there and how they grew up, or whatever. But at the same time, you know, we're we we joke a lot, and but yes. we throw in the jokes here and there not at the person or their profession necessarily just that certain instances maybe that happen in their life where they're thinking the same thing yes. and i think that's what really works and i maybe i'm like you know sucking our own dicks about this but i think that every guest that we've had i think they enjoy us as much as we enjoy them i think we could even like get I everybody would- back on you know Absolutely. I agree with you. And I'm don't worry on some of the ones in the beginning, like ones you weren't there for. Like, I definitely am always wanting to apologize to him. Like, I am so sorry. I was not who I am now. Yeah. Please come back on and, and try it one more time. I've like, changed. I've changed. I don't suck dick anymore. <laughs> At least not bad. I suck get good now. Um, I give you I give you hand jobs in cars. Um, I, I really wish. I could get some of them on, like Ralph Garman. I wish I could get him back on. Be like, look, look how much I've grown, Dad. And he'd be like, yeah. Eddie sorry, Pence can tell that. you. Uh, yeah, it's true. Eddie Pence did tell me. And like when Mark Summers came on, that was something else. Um, I was very happy how happy he was this time. That Because the first time, I feel like Mark was just kind of doing me a favor. This time, he was doing us a favor. But like he seemed to really enjoy himself while doing it this time. Like mm-hmm. I, I got a very nice message from him the next day. And I, I really hope that his health gets better because he is another national treasure that de- you know deserves to be on this fucking planet as long as humanly possible. Yeah. Damn, I didn't know he was sick. Yeah, that I didn't. I didn't really. I knew he was sick back in the day, but I didn't realize as leukemia came back twice, Ooh. dude. Fucking that's Whoa. that's rough. Were you not there for Mark Summers? I was watching bits of it, but then I remember I okay. passed out a little early. Yep, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Mark was uh, Mark had leukemia. He got better. He had leukemia Damn. again. He got better, and he now he has leukemia again. He's going through the whole fucking thing, and it was Fuck. it was really. He said some. If you get a chance, man, go back and listen to it because he says some really real shit about life in there and i fucking am so grateful that he was so candid about it it's right. it's a beautiful thing um so fucking let's think here we have the rest of october coming up um mm-hmm. we have some really spooky guests um i'm gonna try to reach out back to um to mj um she was the uh she was the lovely director and writer or excuse me, director and producer um but she has a really big like uh horror movie knowledge about her so mm-hmm. I really want to get her back on. Plus, she worked on Ash vs. the Evil Dead. And, you know, that's very horror-like. Uh, we have another director coming on, I think, next week. And then we have Mick Strawn coming on after that. So we have a spooky month coming up for you guys. Mick Strawn, of course, um, the, uh, he was the set, produ- set designer for Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5. Ah, 
Or three and four, one of the two, four and five, maybe three, four and five. He was he was in a lot of Nightmare on Elm Streets. Nick's uh Nick's an awesome dude, very, very funny, very different dude. Um, and uh, we're gonna have a very full month for you guys. Let's uh really quickly, we don't have pot to talk about. Thank God we're so we're over with that, which doesn't mean that was a bad experience. It was just very stressful and very long, and we're very grateful it's done with. But let's, uh, let's talk about let's yeah. to very tired we're all very tired um let's talk about this um this is what's the difference uh podcast we we are one of the shows on the you suck network um there is also yelling at clouds with the great eric fluger um every week or so he comes on and he goes on an amazing rant about something that um you care about last time it was a uh, star wars or no no it was space odyssey star- or something like that yeah, star trek 1970s yes. space odyssey and star yes. trek set on yeah, 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 so like you, you definitely need to be checking out that. There's a weekly show Wednesday Night Live, which you can find me, Alex Wiley, and David Raby every single week. Um, and it's it, we deep dive on stuff, we play games, we just have a good time, we just make each other laugh. Yeah, yeah. we just get around, hang around, shoot the shit. Absolutely, and, and see all where the these, conversation takes you. Know, pretty much. Sometimes yeah. it's just me and David. Sometimes it's just me and Alex. Sometimes it's all three of us. We and sometimes we bring on a guest. All these amazing shows can be found on YouSuckNetwork.com, guys. That is the hub and home of everything that is you suck. Um, we have a great time over there. We have um, all of our podcasts, including the old, um, uh, the old. Uh, what, what was Jamie and Tom's show called? Chronicles. Chronicles, thank you. Uh, even including the old Chronicle stuff before they moved on and started their own website, and we're very still, of course, very very happy with them because we Jamie was just barely on a pod day with us and he killed mm-hmm. it, fucking slaughtered it. So thank you very much to Jamie and Tom for continuing to put in the work with us, even though you know you guys you know flew out the nest and f- spread your wings and all that type of happy horse stuff. Um, and all this is it, thanks to our sponsor at webwatch.com webwatch.com guys. They make websites. That's what they do. They don't make biscuits. They don't make fucking, um, scones. dildos. They don't make scones. They don't make any of these things that go in your mouth. <laughs> they, make, <laughs> they make websites. That's exactly what they do. And Pete white had a dream one day. He's like, I need to make websites for the masses. So whether you have a, Etsy and OnlyFans, whatever the fuck it might be that you're trying to sell or, you know, or hawk your wares or even just show pics of your cats, you need a website because social media is great and all, but it doesn't do what a website do. And it takes a lot of time to make a website. Do you have time? I don't. That's why I reached over to webwatch.com and they're like, we'll build your website. And if you look at yousucknetwork.com, you can see an example of one of their amazing websites. So reach out and tell them the you suck guys sent you. Um, David, this has been fucking fantastic. It was amazing. I kind of didn't want it to end. No, neither did I. I really wish I could have been like en- encroach on his generosity and be like, hey, so what do you think about going for another hour? Yeah, um, right. Just oh, you another yeah. hour? I would. No, no, no. He's got, he's got like six more hours in him. God Shit. damn, that dude's brilliant. Um, guys, this has been What's the Difference Podcast. I am Tom Bruno. I'm David Raby. And good night. Hi, this is Ickis from our real monsters. And um, I would like very much to ask you, if you don't mind, to watch um the USAC Network with Tom Bruno and Alex. Oh, that's all. I have to go flush myself now.